listening to The Rick Smith Show. For more information, go to thericksmithshow.com. If you've missed any portion of the program, you can download the podcast at thericksmithshow.com. You're listening to Win Workers Independent News, a diversified media enterprises production. I'm Doug Cunningham. AFL-CIO Government Affairs Representative Tom Trotter says the Labor Federation was hopeful that it could work with Trump on at least one thing, a trillion-dollar infrastructure investment. But with only $200 billion in real federal money on the table in the Trump budget, it looks like any infrastructure investment from Congress will fall short of what's really needed. Trotter says the American Society of Civil Engineers does regular reports on the cost of our failure to act on U.S. infrastructure. The engineers say America needs a 46 trillion dollar infrastructure investment to properly rebuild U.S. infrastructure. What they showed this March was $4.6 trillion need and to bring our infrastructure, all components of it, up to a state of good repair. So a trillion dollars was in the right ballpark to get things moving. It's a big task ahead, but we are all about creating not just jobs, but good jobs and middle class jobs, career jobs. And one way to do that is through fixing our infrastructure, not just the construction side of things, but operationally, the transit workers and the supply side. If we're buying U.S steel and other components for these projects is also creating jobs. So it's one of these that should be a win-win-win all the way around. The American Society of Civil Engineers say failure to act to invest in this rebuild of roads and bridges will cost America $3.9 trillion in lost gross national product by 2025. If we fail to act, it will also cost America 2.5 million jobs and $7 trillion in lost business sales by 2025. It's staggering. And the reality is we're already suffering from that. I mean, because of the state of our infrastructure right now, we're already not gaining the jobs we should. Our economic growth is constrained because of the state of our infrastructure. You can't move goods across the country efficiently. Our competitiveness is suffering. I mean, this is already ongoing. 2,000 IBEW Local 3 technicians have been on strike for over nine weeks at Spectrum Cable in New York City and New Jersey. On the New York City picket lines, Wynn interviewed this striker, who chose not to give his name, about the issues in this strike. The CEO was the highest paid CEO in the whole country at $98.5 million till 2021. They could justify giving him an increase of something like over $70 million a year. But yet the workers who are making their money, interacting with the public, they can't give them a fair contract, fair medical plan. Another issue is disciplining workers for failure to meet the speeds customers expect at Spectrum. And the union says that is caused by Spectrum's lack of proper infrastructure repairs and improvements. Win is brought to you in part by the Amalgamated Transit Union the largest labor union representing transit and allied workers in the U.S. and Canada. Online at atu.org. You've been listening to Win Workers Independent News. For more information, visit laborradio.org. It's time for the Rick Smith Show. I want you to get up now. I want all of you to get up out of your chairs. I want you to get up right now and go to the window, open it, and stick your head out and yell... I'm as mad as hell, and I'm not going to take this anymore! I don't want to abolish government. I simply want to reduce it to the size where I can drag it into the bathroom and drown in the bathtub. You better cut the taxes at the top. How dare you? How dare you? Go ahead. Make my day. The Rick Smith Show starts now. now. Sisters, working class heroes, this is the Rick Smith Show. And oh, what a day it's going to be. Uh, as we speak, uh, James Comey has taken the hot seat, uh, getting ready for the beginning of the chairman uh, giving his opening statements. 
And look, this is it. This is the day. Uh, it's Comic Con. And you know, look, you yesterday, uh, James Comey came out with his what what his remarks are going to be, and people jumped right on them. And look, uh, this is a major spectacle. If you look at the reports coming out of Washington D.C., the entire nation's capital is shut down, paralyzed by this by this hearing. I mean, I, people are sending me pictures of of lines around the block to get into a bar let alone to get into the 88 seats that are set aside for we the people in the hearing room. Uh, just to get into a bar, you've got to wait around the block. This is this is something that generations uh, into the future are going to talk about this day. Uh, we're going to remember this day like, you know, just like the Watergate hearings. Uh, this could be the, well, this could be the beginning of the end. And I've been waiting for Donald Trump to tweet uh, I'm going to be following that all all day because uh, I don't think he can help himself. I don't think he has the impulse control. And yesterday, the re- prepared remarks uh, that he handed out, James Comey, uh, look, at the end of it, uh, you know, a lot of stuff we knew, a lot of stuff maybe we didn't know, um, a lot of stuff maybe we, we should have known earlier, a lot of questions that have popped up in my mind anyway. Uh, but you look at some of the things, and the, and the first, you know, the big one for me was the difference between President Obama and President Trump. Uh, the fact that James Comey said that he was, he felt compelled to document his first conversation with President-elect Trump uh, in a memo. That was in his, the first meeting, and I'd want to know what what was it about Trump that made you say. Uh, I I need to document this. He said that he needed to do it to ensure accuracy. He said, I began to type it on a laptop in an FBI vehicle outside Trump Tower the moment I walked out of the meeting. He said, creating written records immediately after one-on-one conversations with Mr. Trump was my practice from that point forward. This is not, this had not been my practice in the past. I spoke alone with President Obama twice in person and never on the phone, once in 2015 to discuss law enforcement policy issues and a second time briefly to say goodbye to him in late 2016. Neither of those circumstances uh, did I memorialize the discussion. Uh, Because, look, um, Obama wasn't under investigation for colluding with the Russians. Uh, the other th- couple of other big bombshells that came out and, and are going to come out of his testimony, uh, the need for loyalty. And look, you know this about Trump. You know that he, he, he that's what he, above all, you know, competency be, be damned, need loyalty, absolute loyalty. And that came out. You know, Comey said after a dinner on January 27th, uh, he said the president began by asking me, me whether I wanted to stay as FBI director which I found strange because he had already told me twice in earlier conversations that he had hoped I would stay, and I assured him that I intended to. A few moments later, the president said, I need loyalty. I expect loyalty. Comey writes, I didn't move, speak, or change my facial expression in any way during the awkward silence that followed. We simply looked at each other in silence. And you go... Well, hold on a second. You know, is Chris Christie right? Is this just how things are done in New York? Was this just a New York conversation? Uh, I, I don't know. <laughs> what I know is, you know, and maybe Christie's right. You know, maybe Trump just isn't isn't smart enough to understand the ways of 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 you know governance, the ways of transparency, the ways of well of of not strong arming and twisting people's arms. Maybe, maybe. Uh, But here's the thing. I think everybody knows what that means. I think everybody knows that that's a a feeler for you to go, hey, look, I want you to do my bidding. Not the bidding of we the people, but my bidding. You're my guy. Evidently, after a February 14th Oval Office meeting, Comey and his colleagues decided that they would uh, not follow the president's wishes, and they he wrote, uh, the president then returned to the topic of Mike Flynn, saying he's he's a guy, 
uh, that's been through a lot. He repeated that Flynn hadn't done anything wrong on his calls with the Russians. Uh, he had been he had misled the vice president. Uh, then he said, I hope you can see your way clear of letting this go to letting Flynn go. He's a good guy. I hope you can let this go. Uh, he, Flynn or, uh, Comey writes, I replied only that he is a good guy. After the meeting, he writes, I immediately prepared an unclassified memo. That's important because you cannot you can't come back and say, well, it's classified. We can't you can't see it. He said, look, I, this is an unclassified memo of the conversation about Flynn and the discussion uh, and discuss the matter with FBI senior leadership. Uh, he said it was very concerning, given the FBI's role as an independent investigative or agency. He said the FBI leadership team agreed with me that it was important not to infect the investigative team with the president's request, which we did not tend to ab- abide. Uh, look, you know, you go down the list of all of these these things. Uh, you know, Comey saying, "Look, it was <laughs> inappropriate; it should never happen." Uh, the fact that he wanted the attorney general to stay in the room and not leave him alone. And it got, you know, I said this yesterday, you know, you got to wonder, you know, now James Comey, a six foot eight guy, uh, you know, powerful guy knows what, you know, what every 15 year old beauty queen knows. Uh, you don't want to be left in a room with, with Donald Trump and don't drink anything. Oh no, that's, that's never mind. That's, it's Bill Cosby. N- n- wrong one. Uh, but I think my favorite, my favorite little tidbit out of Comey's, uh, written prepared statement was uh, in a March 30th phone call. Uh, he says, on the morning of March 30th, the president called me at the FBI. He described the Rus- Russia investigation as a cloud that was impairing his ability to act on behalf of the country. He said he had nothing to do with Russia. He had not been involved with hookers and had always assumed that he was being recorded when in Russia. Uh, the hooker thing on his mind. Now, that, that's, you know, obviously the Steele dossier and all of the stuff that comes out of there. And I love the right wing talking points because even Steele is saying we can't corroborate that there were hookers. We can't you know, we, we can't corroborate that, the, you know, the P story is actually the golden shower story is actually accurate. But it is something that was out there. So you include that in this because you want to know what the worst case, what you want to know, everything that's out there. And if you've ever done op- opposition research, you want to know everything that the opponents are going to say. So even the most salacious, the most outrageous, the most ridiculous, you want it because you want to have a response for it. Anybody doing op research should know, you know, well, you know, we want to know everything. Um, and, you know, what the right wing is doing is they're going, well, this little piece of it wasn't accurate. So the whole dossier is, is wow, it's, it's all garbage, which isn't true. There was a lot in that, an awful lot. Now today, there's going to be a lot of questions, uh, and you know Comey's going to get grilled as 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 he should. And I've got a lot of questions. You know, at what point did you did you? I mean, I think the big one is, you know, what about that first meeting? What about that meeting that made you go from this point forward? I have to document everything that happens. Now, you, look, Comey meets, you know, hundreds of people all the time, dignitaries, uh, elected officials, you name it, all Donald. What was it about Trump that sent his radar off? What was it about Trump that made you go, you know, this, there, there's something here. You know, did Trump ask for, you know, other things, you know, investigate Hillary to go after, you know, political enemies, payback, any of that stuff? How much pressure did they exert? I mean, there's a lot of this stuff here that you just got to go, Wow. And, you know, I keep going back to that moment where Trump called him out and said, hey, he's more popular than I am. Called him across the room, blew him a kiss, shook his hand. Got to wonder what that was about. And the other part of this, you know, that call for loyalty. Do you want, I mean, honestly, do you want your investigatory agencies to be loyal to the president or to the constitution and we, the people. I mean, there's a lot of this stuff that's just, wow. Now the RNC has got their talking points. Uh, They, uh, they believe that Trump's been completely vindicated, completely and totally vindicated. Uh, Because Comey said that, yeah, I, I told him that he directly wasn't under investigation. 
Uh, and, you know, they'll keep hammering that. You know, they told the president three times. You know, it's kind of like Beetlejuice. Uh, and they're also running around saying, look, the testimony confirms, you know, President Trump did not impede or engage in obstruction of justice of the inf- investigation. I don't buy that one at all. At all. Now, the GOP is also going to argue that Trump fired Comey for the good of the country. It wasn't because, you know, the, the Russia. It was because it was the right thing to do because, um, you know, he was just bad. And it was, you know, he Trump knew it was going to be, be a problem. Trump knew it was going to harm his presidency, but he did it anyway because he loves the country and he waves the flag and he's going to make America great again and all that other stuff. The question is, is what do you believe? What do we believe? What do we buy in all of this? Uh, today is going to be that day where there is going to be so much, so much to talk about. I'm going to take a quick break. When we come back, Tim Chirac's going to be here, give us some of his thoughts on, on well, the hearing, the privatization of our intelligence, and, well, you know, the you know, politics being the, the, the game of the wealthy. Quick break. Right back after this. Stick around. You listen to The Rick Smith Show. We're working people. Come to talk. All of my life I've searched for clarity. I have wrestled with two paths buried deep inside of me. I lost some rounds, been knocked around, felt my share of defeat. Yet somehow I've always managed to get back on my feet. I'm Rick Smith, and this is Labor History in Two. On this day in labor history, the year was 1904. That was the day that John Carley, a union miner, was shot down in Dunville, Colorado. Carley was part of a strike in the Cripple Creek gold mining region. The miners had gone out on strike in support of workers at the Standard Mill in Colorado City, which processed the mined ore. Colorado Governor Peabody was determined to break the strike. He called in the state militia, who joined forces with company army gun thugs, with 1,000 rifles and 60,000 rounds of ammunition to back them up. General Sherman Bell, a veteran of Teddy Roosevelt's Rough Riders squad in the Spanish-American War, led the National Guard. During the strike, one of General Bell's deputies is said to have declared, To hell with the Constitution! We aren't going by the Constitution! This pretty much summed up General Bell's approach to the conflict. The militia began to round up Union miners. More than 1,500 miners were captured and given a so-called trial by the militia. 238 of these miners were then deported from the region. They were shipped by train to Denver, Kansas, and New Mexico and warned not to return. The militia learned of a group of pro-Union workers at a small encampment known as Dunville. General Bell loaded up more than 100 militiamen and company deputies on a train and headed for the camp. There they exchanged gunfire with the miners. 65 miners, armed with just 10 guns among them, had little chance against the well-armed company men. John Carley was killed and 14 miners were arrested. The Union was crushed in the sights of a thousand guns. For more information, go to laborhistoryin2.com, like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter at Labor History in 2. Chances are, when you took a shower this morning, an AFSCME member made sure that water was clean. When you drove to work, an AFSCME member maintained the road. When you rode an elevator, an AFSCME member inspected it. I'm David Philman, Executive Director of AFSCME Council 13, the American Federation of State, County, and Municipal Employees. AFSCME members enforce regulations, keep prisoners behind bars, take care of patients, protect the environment, and more. The work isn't glamorous, the salaries aren't high, but AFSCME members serve the public in every aspect of our daily lives. Chances are, you'll never see that AFSCME member working in a sewage plant, diving underwater to repair a bridge, or answering a 911 call. But aren't you glad they do? For more information, visit AFSCME13.org. We are AFSCME. We are AFSCME. Radio of, for, and by, we the working people. The Rick Smith Show. Welcome 
Welcome back to The Rick Smith Show. Check out the website, thericksmithshow.com. Questions, comments, something on your mind. You can email me, Rick, at thericksmithshow.com. Uh, you know, again, this is one of those days where I love doing what I'm doing, but I should be glued with the bowl of popcorn in front of the Comey earrings. That's I think all we all should be doing. Uh, as the F- former FBI chief has now began his testimony, or now begun his testimony, uh, and and look, you know, tons of questions to get to today, and, and we're not going to get Tim Chirac on. Uh, evidently, he's glued to the TV as well. Uh, and, and again, you know, I look at this. There's there's so many so many moments. Uh, I mean, I've got a lot of questions around just the idea of obstruction of justice and and what. You know what the president did. Now, look. You know what we're being told is, well, you know what the Republicans want us to believe is, well, you know he was just he was trying to help out a friend. You know he's a good guy. You know just kind of let it go. It's you know there's there's no there there. You know there, you know, there's no there's no there's no collusion. And look, do I believe Donald Trump called up Putin? And I've said this a bunch of times. Do I think Trump called up Putin and said, hey, how can we rig this thing? No, I don't. I, I don't think he would. I don't think he'd do that. But I think his people would. I think all of those people around him with all of the ties. And every time we turn around, there's another tie to Russian oil money. There's another tie to the Russian oligarchy. There's another tie to the Kremlin. And it's it's really scary stuff. Because the reality is, and, and I go back to, you know, my, you know, I go back to, you know, growing up as a kid going, you know, I remember the Cold War. I, I remember that, that, you know, at any minute, mutually assured destruction. That you didn't trust the Russian government. You didn't trust the Soviet government. You just didn't do it. Uh, you communicated with them, but you didn't trust them. And somehow now you've got the Republican Party who, well, you know, they, they're, they're good guys. And the question that I keep coming back to is what is it about his meeting with Trump that made him say, I need to I need to document this stuff. And when all of this stuff was going on, why didn't he uh, inform Congress? Why didn't he, uh, you know, move this along into an investigative saying, look, you know, I'm the head of the FBI and I've got this the president who's strong arming. Uh, was, was there anybody else who was trying to twist his arm? Uh, and we know that Priebus was, you know, out there giving some words, and, you know, was the vice president. You know, trying to twist his arm. There's there's a lot to this. And you know, you keep coming back to these these moments. And and to me, the, the, the weird, the creepy thing is 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 the loyalty. And honestly, is the, you know, as FBI director, do you have loyalty to the president? Does anyone in the administration have absolute loyalty to the to the president? I mean, I understand the the concept of you you work at the pleasure of the of the president and all of that, but do you have is it that you're loyal to the presidency to, you know, to maybe break the rules? To do something that, you know, you wouldn't otherwise do or that is it is in opposition to what your agency and what what the mission is? You know, now the the Republicans are throwing out this talking point that, you know, you know, Comey was a terrible. He was terrible. It's horrible. I, you know, I got to ask, you know, did, did you know, uh, did President Trump, you know, say, hey, you're doing a horrible job? I mean, there wasn't a uh, doing a heck of a job brownie moment, but, you know, the big kiss and the handshake and, and all of that stuff, that kind of leads you to think that they were doing a, that, you know, he was at least, you know, competent. Uh, did the uh, did the deputy attorney general say anything? Did the attorney general say anything? Did anyone say anything uh, that you're doing a crummy job. Your 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 job performance is terrible. I know there's a lot of a lot of nonsense, and you've got Comey saying, "Look, you know the, the White House and Trump is trying to to defame him. Uh, they're trying to uh, defame the, the the FBI." And I guess the big question is, you know, was Russia the reason you were fired? I mean, there's a lot of this stuff that you go, lots of questions. And I think the fact that you've got you've got Comey, who is a smart guy. Look, in a, in a battle of the wits between Comey and Trump, uh, I would put my dollar on Comey every time. 
every time. This is very, well, this is very public. This is very much of a spectacle. And, and you know, look, and this is one of the things that the Republicans are also saying. He was grandstanding. He was a showboat. I look at this and say, no, not so much grandstanding as a showboat, but not allowing himself to be maligned in the public eye without being out there fighting. And actually having the ammunition, the fact that he wrote everything down at the time and told people around him what was going on uh, gives him really the, the upper hand. And the fact that, look, you know, we as Americans, and especially Republicans, are going to have to come around to the reality that the Russians did meddle in our elections. And while I think this is somewhat of a distraction from where I think the real theft happened, which is with, with all the voter suppression and all of the, all of the gimmicks and tactics and games that Republicans have played over the years with the ballot box, this is still important. This is extremely important. And I think it's something that you have to get to the bottom of. This cannot be left alone. Simply cannot. And, you know, you stop and you look at this stuff. And, you know, with Robert Mueller coming on. And, you know, you got to ask the question of, Comey, did you have any conversations with Mueller? Uh, is, is he okay with you doing this? Are you screwing up his investigation? There's a lot of this stuff. But, you know, I go back to that talking point of, well, you know, three times he was told. You got to wonder if there's a if Donald Trump understands the difference between criminal investigation and a counterintelligence investigation. You got to wonder if if, you know, because, look, you're not under criminal investigation. And Comey made that clear. You're not under criminal investigation. But there there are investigations going on. Because, look, I, I think when you start looking at all of the different things that have popped up, the Manafort, the Page, the, uh, the Lewandow, the, the, uh, the, the Eric Prince, uh, you just go down the list of all of the, the well, the surrogates, uh, Sessions, you know, uh, yeah, previous, you go down the list. And even, you know, the, FBI, the, the guy that Trump yesterday announced was going to be his FBI director, uh, even he's got ties to Russian oil money. So I guess he's going to be really safe there. I keep coming back to we need this this more than anything. This this spectacle has to happen. The conversation has to happen. And if there are tapes out there as Donald Trump said there are or threatened that there may be uh, I think I think we absolutely need absolutely need to have those tapes and look this isn't a witch hunt to go get donald trump this is to know what happened and the abuse of power and to make sure it doesn't happen again and i, I get i get this people from people all the time well what about hillary you know I, I and i hate that but hillary well but hillary what if hillary were to have done this i would say lock her up too this has nothing to do with party or ideology. This has everything to do with the abuse of power. And again, if you go back to you know, our shows and talking about uh, Trump in the White House back during the election, all of this was very predictable. This is stuff that CEOs do. You will be loyal to me. You will do what I say. You will do when I say, or you will be fired. No questions, none of that. And even, you know, look, you know, we even just saw Jeff Sessions. It's been reported, and I don't buy it, but it's been reported that even Jeff Sessions has said, hey, if you're going you're gonna to meddle in what I'm doing, I, I got I to gotta go. Uh, I'm going to resign. Now, I don't buy it. Look, I think that was his attempt to make himself look somewhat independent. But if it is true, Imagine the kind of strong arming going on there. Now, at the end of this, what what my big question is, is what did the Russians do? What did the Trump people know? And what was their corroboration? Uh, 
I believe that, as Senator Mark Warner has said, that you know what Russian hackers uh, did is far greater and far broader than than what any of us think. The information that these intelligence committees have before them and aren't sharing, the information that Comey has and isn't sharing, I think is much, much greater than than anything that we can imagine. And, and my fear is that it's so bad that they know if they release it that we're going to be running for the exits. Uh, we're going to be out there with pitchforks. So I'm curious, your thoughts. Uh, vindicated, did you read the comments? Uh, 1-888-520-RICK, 1-888-520-7425. Um, did he fire Comey for cause? Did he know it was going to be detrimental to his uh, to his time in the White House? I'm curious your thoughts. 1 888 520 Rick. 1 888 520 7425. Quick break. Right back. This is Solidarity News on Radio Labor. This is a Radio Labor News Update. I'm Mark Belanger. More than 5,000 government, employer, and union representatives are meeting in Geneva at the annual conference of the International Labor Organization this week and next. The ILO is the UN agency focused on matters of work in the world. It is operated as a tripartite organization with representatives from labor, employers, and governments. The theme of this year's conference is the future of work, with an emphasis on the effects of climate change on employment. In his opening address to the delegates, the head of the workers' group at the ILO, Luc Kotebeck, emphasized that any action on climate change should consider the effects on workers and their need for a just transition to greener, more sustainable economies. The international trade union movement's uh, engagement on climate change is based on our realization that millions of jobs and lives are at risk if we do not combat climate change. Trade unions have a vital role to play in protecting jobs in existing workplaces and industries by demanding sustainable industrial transformation, organizing workers in new decent jobs, emerging from environmentally sound investments and policies, and fighting for the just transition measures that will ensure we leave no one behind. We need more jobs, but jobs that are decent and green. The ILO needs to help us finding an alternative for making decent work and environmental work together, not just at the micro level, knowing investment in clean sectors leads to jobs, but also the macroeconomic level, keeping in mind the overall objective of decent work for all and social justice. The ILO conference in Geneva runs until June 16th. We're hearing about a lot of suicides. That is Kimberly Carlsoy, the head of the Seafarers Trust of the International Transport Workers Federation, the ITF. The trust is the ITF's charity organization, which helps seafarers and their families worldwide. It is an essential operation because the 1.5 million seafarers who work on 55,000 ships help transport 90% of the world's goods. The ITF has been hearing more about suicides amongst the workers in the past few years and is about to embark on a major project to determine the extent of the problem. The issue was discussed at a recent conference of the ITF's seafarers in Cape Town, South Africa recently. While at the conference, Ms. Carlsoy was interviewed by ITF communications officer Andy Con gordon we're at the ITF Seafarers Conference in Cape Town and we've been hearing about the issues around seafarers' health and well-being in the last few hours in the conference. And I'm here with Kimberly Carlshoy from the, uh, the head of the ITF Seafarers Trust. And with seafarers and their health and well-being, what are the particular issues that we, we need to be aware of that you feel we need to raise more awareness about? 
Well, right now we're looking especially into um, social isolation, depression, and, and suicide at the Seafarers Trust. We started in, in um, October with holding a, a large work, work, uh, workshop with 50 experts from within and outside of the maritime industry to discuss what are, the, what are the risk factors, what is it that we know, what don't we know, and what kind of interventions can we use from other, other industries that would be applicable to, to seafarers. Um, now we've taken it so far as we're going to be doing a large study. Um, we're putting out a call for proposals on June 15th to a number of universities, academia and, and others in order to look at what are the risk factors on board. How does seafaring as a profession um, make, make the risk of, of suicide or depression greater or, or lesser? Because it could be there's, the ship is a protective factor as well. We don't know that as yet. Um, what are the demographics? What do they have to do in relation to age and rank? How do they play a factor in, um, in the risk of suicide? And we're looking at nationalities as well, because in some countries, some countries, people are more likely to suicide than in other countries. And how much of an influence does that have in relation to the seafarers on board? And that's it. International labor news you can use. Thank you for listening. And remember, it's all about global solidarity. In the contest for most awful member of Donald Trump's cabinet, you'd assume that Jeff Sessions, the bigoted twerp now serving as attorney general, would be a shoe-in. Suddenly, however, Mick Mulvaney has darted from out of the deepest, meanest darkness of severe right-wing dogma to become the new favorite for awfulest of them all. Who? Mulvaney, a former Tea Party Congress critter from South Carolina, was plucked from obscurity to become Trump's budget director and chief demonizer of America's poor people. The budget he wrote for the Donald savages such effective anti-poverty programs as food stamps, Medicaid, and job training in order to pay for massive, unneeded, and unproductive tax cuts for America's pampered one percenters. But that's not the only reason they want to clobber the poor. For Mulvaney sees himself as the wrathful enforcer of the holy work ethic, a Dickensian character whose job it is to punish the poor for being, in his view, a morally bankrupt class of slothful moochers. The Trump budget is all about compassion, he declaims, explaining that it shows compassion for the poor by compelling them to get a job in order to end their so-called shame of accepting public assistance rather than, quote, taking charge of their own lives. Never mind that most able-bodied adults getting poverty aid already work or are looking for a job. Mulvaney mindlessly barks, we need people to go to work. This is Jim Hightower saying, no, Mick, we need you to go get a clue about the harsh realities of living in poverty, including having to endure constant condescension from judgmental jerk like you who smugly condemn a food stamp family while drawing a six-figure salary from taxpayers, health coverage, pension, and a chauffeured limousine. Congratulations, you're the awfulest of the awful. Hightower's commentaries are brought to you by the Hightower Lowdown, the monthly newsletter with Hightower's take on what Wall Street and Washington are up to. For information, visit HightowerLowdown.org. The Rick Smith Show. Check out the website, the glued to the Comey hearing. Uh, big, I think big statement uh, Comey just came out with. Uh, asked why he chose to memorialize the uh, the conversations he had with, with Donald Trump. He said, you know, the circumstances, the subject matter, and the person himself said, I thought the person might lie about it. I mean, stop and think about this. You're meeting with the President of the United States, and your first inclination is this guy's a liar. Uh, whatever we talk about, this guy's going to have a an alternative fact, an alternative reality, an alternative recollection of what's being said. The circumstances, the matter, and the person. And he also said, look, you know, I knew at some point down the road I was going to have to defend myself 
and the FBI. I mean, I think that speaks volumes. At no point that I can think of in our history have we had this kind of a scenario where you absolutely positively, under no circumstances, can you believe what comes out of the man's mouth. It's scary stuff. Now, look, I mean, the circumstances being what they are, and, and I understand there's an investigation going on. Understand that there's allegations out there that, you know, could put someone in a, well, in a pickle. And the subject matter being that, you know, you're, the Trump campaign, uh, all indications are looking from an intelligence standpoint that there was some shenanigans going on. Now, I go back to my time at the conventions. You know, we're talking the summer of 16, and it's an open secret by now. You know, it's it's one of those things that even the delegates at the convention are are, are you know, kibitzing about and wondering, you know, does this shoe fall? You know, how bad does this how bad does this affect Trump when when everybody else uh, comes around to this open fact that the Russians have got their thumb on the scale? And yet it doesn't happen. And yet, you know, and look, I don't want to be the one who says that that Comey's, you know, you know, he's going to bring down that he's going to save democracy. He's going to bring. He's the reason we're in this mess. Had he chosen to stay out of the the emails nonsense, the the Anthony Weiner nonsense, uh, we wouldn't be in this mess. Understand that. Now the other side, and this is where I keep coming back to, while this is important. The other side of this is, you know, the Republican Party has a lot to do with this as well. That's what I'd like to see an investigation into. All of these voter suppression rules, all of this, 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 you know, cross check and, you know, all of this. We live in a day and an age where we have instant almost everything. You're going to tell me we can't figure out how to make sure that everybody has access to the ballot box. Without having to on a, on the third Tuesday of the month between noon and 1:30 p.m., uh, head to the DMV or to a licensing agent to get a photo ID. Come on. Or you know, here in Pennsylvania, there were a number of counties when Pennsylvania passed the voter ID law. Here, uh, of the 67 counties, I think there were seven that did not have a DMV within their within the county. You'd have to go to another county. To get the voter ID. And now, you know, understand what that's what that's meant to do. That's meant to hold the vote down. That's meant to make sure that people don't have access to the ballot box, don't have access to the franchise. To me, that's where we should be looking as well. Now, this is important because we need to know if our president's a liar. We need to know if there, there's collusion going on with a foreign power. We need to know how much, how deep their, their involvement in the electoral process is. We need to know how, you know, how deep their claws go into our elected officials. You know, understand the the DNC was hacked, as was the DCCC. Um, you're going to tell me that the RNC and the the RCCC wasn't? We know they were, and that's something else I think Comey has to address today. You know, how deep does this go? And I'm hoping that someone will will ask that, you know, how how if you can say, because, you know, there's so much of this stuff that it's, it's a cat and mouse game. How much is classified? How much is, uh, you know, is able to be told to we the people? But I, I, you know, I just think it's something we we absolutely, absolutely have to know. I'm going to take a quick break. When we come back, talk media news. Stick around. This is the Rick Smith Show. Seven, yay, and I'll go to work. Making the blue blood see red. The Rick Smith Show. I'm Rick Smith, and this is Labor History in Two. On this day in labor history, the year was 1917. That was the day the Granite Mountain and Speculator Mines in Butte, Montana, caught fire, killing 168 miners. It is considered the worst underground hard rock mining disaster in the nation's history. Just weeks after the U.S. had entered World War I, the demand for copper had surged. 
Granite Mountain, like many of the nation's mines, operated around the clock to meet war production needs. In his book, Fire and Brimstone, The North Butte Mining Disaster of 1917, Michael Puntke notes the irony of the disaster, which began as an effort to improve safety. A sprinkler system had just been installed. The final task was the relocation of an electrical cable. The cable was insulated with oil-soaked cloth sheathed in lead. Workers lost control of the three-ton cable as they lowered it into the mine and it fell to the bottom of the shaft. Carrying a commonly used carbide burning lamp, the night shift foreman accidentally ignited the cable as he planned its removal. The conflagration was virtually immediate and burned for more than three days. At the time, 415 miners were at work on the overnight shift. Smoke and gases quickly filled both mines. With no alarm system in place, those that could not escape succumbed to carbon monoxide poisoning. In 1996, a memorial plaza was dedicated to those who lost their lives. It details a slice of Butte's mining and labor history that culminated in tragedy. The suffering and the pain We remember to this day the miners, the miners. Labor History in Two brought to you by the Illinois Labor History Society and the Rick Smith Show. The most important issues of the day. This is the Rick Smith Show. I knew something big was going to happen on why he had to document the meeting with Trump. In fact, you know, the, you're looking around. Now, look, this is a guy who's, you know, he's been a prosecutor. He's been the director of the FBI looking around at, at Sessions and Kushner. And he's saying, look, I'm looking at them. They're lingering around. Something is going on. Something is uneasy. Something is not right. And even they know it. Uh, before he's left alone with Donald Trump. And I got to be honest, uh, you know, every person who, who ever goes into individual meetings with people should take lesson from what Comey did. And the second you walk out, write everything down. Uh, I mean, honestly, this is this is a lesson for a lot of us. Anyway, let's find out what's what's going on in the shut down city of Washington, D.C. and around the world. Victoria Jones, Talk Media New. Victoria, what's going on? I'm sorry, I'm so drunk I can't speak. <laughs> uh, as we all should be. No, no, no I'm, I'm actually, uh, all I've had is uh, large, large coffee. Um, yes, uh, James Comey, former FBI director, testifying before the Senate Intelligence Committee a few minutes ago, said that he started uh, writing memos after meeting with President Trump because I was honestly concerned that he might lie about the nature of our meeting. I mean that that's a bumper sticker. <laughs> yeah, that 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 right there, that right there is a bumper sticker. He didn't keep um, memos of his meetings with either President Obama or President George W. Bush. And again, I think that speaks volumes. And as he said, look, it was the circumstance, the subject matter, and the person that made him memorialize every meeting. Yeah, I mean, it, it, you know, he he opened his testimony by saying that um, uh, the, uh, the Trump administration badmouthed the Bureau and his leadership to justify the firing, saying those were lies, plain and simple, yeah. uh, which is e extraordinary. Um, this is really um, quite a blunt hearing. Now, of course, he is saying that some things um, are classified and they'll hear more in the, you know, in the classified hearing, um, uh, in, in 20, 30, 50 years, we, we may be remembering this uh, as, as a lot of people still remember Watergate. With his look uh, in the dining room at the White House. And, and they've got the him White duct House. taped to a chair. Well, that's what I'm thinking. I'm thinking that, that there are, there's no phones. You know, um, and he doesn't have, well, he doesn't use a computer, but he has no access to a phone, so he can't tweet. So the fact that he's with people is must indicate that he is not tweeting. But it doesn't mean to say that he's not going to explode at 5 o'clock tomorrow morning. 
as we should all wait for. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, everybody is checking their Twitter feed, you know, like constantly. But there was nothing. There's been nothing. But it, it can't, obviously it can't last. No, no. And I, I have the mindset that you should have let him at least tweet out something, you know, little kittens or something just to get it out of his system so it doesn't pent up and, and explode. Well, that's it. I mean, it, it cannot. You know, it's so far, you know, Mark Kasowitz, who is, who is you know, as, as, as almost uh, who is as strong a character as Trump. He's, he's that kind of a lawyer. Right. Um, uh, is his lawyer, and uh, so I'm sure he's speaking to him the way that Trump speaks to him. So there's there's some you know there's some fairly uh, fairly um, tough language going on right now. But yeah. for now, Trump is listening to his lawyer, and as you know from this great story by Mike Isikoff in, in in Yahoo that came out over the last day or so, at least four of the top law firms in Washington D.C. turned down the possibility of uh, acting for Donald Trump. Well, wouldn't you? I mean, look, I mean, are you going to defend somebody who tomorrow is going to undermine you and probably implicate you? Well, that 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 was it. They, you know, they said that he wouldn't do, you know, they, he wouldn't follow their advice. They also said that uh, he was a slow payer. No kidding. Uh, just, slow payer. By, so by slow payer, you mean not paying you, cheating well, you out of it. There was that. Oh man, that, that well, you know, it is what it is. But you know, here, here's you go back to this, and you go, uh, you you listen to what I've been able to to get in between breaks and stuff, and you know, in the battle of wits, uh, I think Trump picked really the wrong battle. This is what he's learning. Uh, is he learning? This is what he's finding out about Washington D.C. It's one thing to do this stuff in New York and Miami real estate. Right. It's another thing to do it in Washington, D.C. with really smart people who know the rules and who are not afraid of fighting back because they not only know the rules, they know that there are laws. Yep. So are you buying the Chris Christie frame then? Because, you, you know, you, you've said that he doesn't really know anything because Chris Christie basically said, well, he's learning and he's learning in public. And, you know, he was just having he was just having New York City talk. It was just a no. New York City conversation. No, no, I, no, I no, I don't I don't uh, I don't buy that. Um, I, I do think that, uh, that, that there, there may be uh, an element of truth to this is how he gets things done. Of course. Um, you know, the, but uh, but is that acceptable for a president um no all right well um i'm still waiting for the, i'm eagerly waiting for those tweets to come out uh but at the end of this i mean the reality is, is uh the i'm hoping today we we find out some of you know maybe how deep the russian involvement in all of this is now look i've been saying for a long time the voter suppression and the republicans did far more than the russians could have done in stealing this election but i still want to know what the russians did and how deep it goes well i mean we heard a certain amount um from uh the nsa document that was leaked by the uh, the leaker with the um with with the with the reality the, winner is her name. Reality winner with the name, you know, the, with with the name. Really, does, that, does anybody have that name? Yeah. <laughs> yeah the you know, the she worst was leak in the world. It's the South. Who seemed to have been turned in by her own outlet. Yeah. Again, you know, and I know people at the inter- intercept, and you go, "What exactly were you thinking?" Yeah. Honestly, you uh, really you did it on your work computer, and and you folded, the, and you know, um, unbelievable, unbelievable. Absolutely unbelievable, uh, yeah. but again, we're not. You know, look. You know, we're we're not dealing with uh, with rocket scientists, um, and again, we've not got one in the White House either. Uh, so, how long do you think this is going to go on? How how long is the city of Washington going to be paralyzed? Because I I've been getting pictures of people around the block waiting not to get into the hearing of which there are only eighty eight seats, but just to get into a bar. I know. Well, it's, well, of course, once they're in, you know, they're in. They're not going anywhere. Uh, so I, I think that um, there is there's a classified session this afternoon. This is only supposed to us last this morning. And the way these these hearings are is they normally have a one round, and then if they haven't finished their questions, they'll have a second round. What they might do is just have the one round and then take the second round to the classified session. Um, unless the, the senators want to have a second round in public, you know, but 
uh, they, they may want to move on to the second round. May I just make a fashion statement and say it looks like Senator Dianne Feinstein is wearing a seersucker suit? Yes. Um, you always have to mention seersucker in Washington, D.C. anytime it's being worn. Because <laughs> it's such a fun word. Uh, it's a sort of homage to the late uh, senator from West Virginia, Robert Byrd. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, and, and there she is doing her thing. Um, if you had a, if you had the ability to ask a question, what, what would it be? You know, I I, I think uh, I I think I would ask. Um, do what did Donald Trump say to you that um, the, did he say anything to you that you have not put in the memo because it was so stunning to you that you just didn't feel you could put it in? Oh wow. Uh, what did you omit? That's a, it's a good it's a good a good one. Uh, I I, I want to go back to the, I'd want to go back to you know what was it about the person that I, I get the whole I feel he would like you know what 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 tell me about that sense that you have of that when you meet this guy because you know I, yesterday I said you know here's this six foot eight powerful guy who now knows what every fifteen year old beauty queen knows when they're left alone with Trump you know but what was it about it that made you go you know this I've got it this is this is trouble yeah now Senator Rich. Um, who's Republican, is passing Trump's words. He is, uh, um, he is saying uh, that he did not direct you to let it go, not in his words, no. Again, those words are not in order. He said, I hope, right. answer. The reason I keep saying his words is I took it as a direction. This is the president of the United States. I took it as a direction. Question, you don't know anyone who has been charged for hoping something? Answer, as I sit here, I don't. No, but here's the thing. Uh, if, if you're buying the New York City talk frame, uh, I hope you'll do something means uh, if you don't, I'll break your freaking legs. Well, the, the, well, yes. I mean, if the president of the United States, States says, um, I hope you'll move that off my desk. I mean, you know, if you don't. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, interesting stuff. Now, yesterday, the president tried to steal the news cycle by uh, nominating a new FBI director who we find out has ties with Russian oil oil companies. Um, and tried to do a little infrastructure stuff to try and steal the the news cycle. Uh, any luck on that? Well, I mean, Christopher Ray, the the uh, new, newly nominated uh, FBI director, is generally considered okay. I mean, yes, he's got ties, you know, but you know, don't we all? Don't we all? You know, something. Um, but uh, but the infrastructure that that didn't work out so well because. Nobody was paying very much attention, and because Trump's speech standing by the on the Ohio, you know on the Ohio River was, um, he kept first of all he talked about his his win in Ohio, and then he kept going on about Obamacare, um, and and then he kept talking about other things at the same time as he was talking about infrastructure. So it was very difficult for him to get any traction on the speech, and this of course the same day as the. The written testimony of Comey came out, so it was stamped over. It's been very difficult for him to get traction. The first day of Infrastructure Week was the day when he announced that he wanted to privatize the um, air traffic uh, control. And that morning, he he sent out a flurry of tweets on uh, all kinds of controversial issues and, and stepped all over himself. Yeah. Uh, it, it, all in all, been a fun, fun, fun week so far. And there's more to come. And there's more to come. And finally, is oh, Obama... he's tweeted. He's tweeted. No way. The, what, what, he's tweeted? He's picked up on Senator Rich's passing of, passing of Trump's words, I hope you do this, Trump said. Tr- Trump has said, hoping and telling are two very different things. You would think that a guy like Comey would know that. Hashtag give me a break. Interesting. Oh, no, sorry. That's Donald Trump Jr., Okay, because I was looking at his feed and I'm not seeing it. No, it's Donald uh, Trump I, Jr. I'm Hashtag saying maybe they del- maybe they they snatched it and deleted it before before I could read it. No, no, it's just he, he, he's, his his son's doing it. Like 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 a toddler grabbing your cell phone. Yeah, yeah. Oh, uh, Comey is saying, "Lordy, I hope there are tapes." Oh, I I hope there are too. Good stuff, Victoria. I appreciate the time. Back to the back to the screen. Thank you. Thank you so much, Victoria Jones. Talk media news. Uh, yeah, uh, I, I can just imagine it. Tied up in the West Wing uh, with the cell phone just out of arm's reach. Quick break, right back.
Radio of, for, and by We the Working People. The Rick Smith Show. You're listening to The Rick Smith Show. For more information, go to thericksmithshow.com. If you've missed any portion of the program, you can download the podcast at thericksmithshow.com. You're listening to Win Workers Independent News, a diversified media enterprises production. I'm Doug Cunningham. AFL-CIO Government Affairs Representative Tom Trotter says the Labor Federation was hopeful that it could work with Trump on at least one thing, a trillion-dollar infrastructure investment. But with only $200 billion in real federal money on the table in the Trump budget, it looks like any infrastructure investment from Congress will fall short of what's really needed. Trotter says the American Society of Civil Engineers does regular reports on the cost of our failure to act on U.S. infrastructure. The engineers say America needs a 46 trillion dollar infrastructure investment to properly rebuild U.S. infrastructure. What they showed this March was $4.6 trillion need and to bring our infrastructure, all components of it, up to a state of good repair. So a trillion dollars was in the right ballpark to get things moving. It's a big task ahead, but we are all about creating not just jobs, but good jobs and middle class jobs and career jobs. And one way to do that is through fixing our infrastructure, not just the construction side of things, but operationally, the transit workers and the supply side. If we're buying U.S steel and other components for these projects is also creating jobs. So it's one of these that should be a win-win-win all the way around. The American Society of Civil Engineers say failure to act to invest in this rebuild of roads and bridges will cost America $3.9 trillion in lost gross national product by 2025. If we fail to act, it will also cost America 2.5 million jobs and $7 trillion in lost business sales by 2025. It's staggering. And the reality is we're already suffering from the, that. I mean, because of the state of our infrastructure right now, we're already not gaining the jobs we should. Our economic growth is constrained because of the state of our infrastructure. You can't move goods across the country efficiently. Our competitiveness is suffering. I mean, this is already ongoing. 2,000 IBEW Local 3 technicians have been on strike for over nine weeks at Spectrum Cable in New York City and New Jersey. On the New York City picket lines, Wynn interviewed this striker, who chose not to give his name, about the issues in this strike. The CEO was the highest paid CEO in the whole country at $98.5 million till 2021. They could justify giving him an increase of something like over $70 million a year. But yet the workers who are making their money, interacting with the public, they can't give them a fair contract, fair medical plan. Another issue is disciplining workers for failure to meet the speeds customers expect at Spectrum. And the union says that is caused by Spectrum's lack of proper infrastructure repairs and improvements. Win is brought to you in part by the Amalgamated Transit Union the largest labor union representing transit and allied workers in the U.S. and Canada. Online at atu.org. You've been listening to WIN, Workers' Independent News. For more information, visit laborradio.org. So we won the evangelicals. We won with young. We won with old. We won with highly educated. We won with poorly educated. I love the poorly educated. We're the smartest people. We're the most loyal people. Back to the Rick Smith Show. Check out the website, thericksmithshow.com. Arnold says, I'm waiting for him to tweet out the no- nuclear launch codes. Uh, he's just so waiting to get, get to the Twitters. And again, I go back to uh, the Comey testimony, uh, his bit on the 27th uh, at the dinner at the White House. He's, he writes, uh, the president began by asking me whether I wanted to stay on as FBI director, which I found strange because he had already told me twice in earlier conversations that he'd hoped I would stay, and I had assured him that I intended to. A few minutes later, the president said, I need loyalty. I expect loyalty. I didn't move, speak, or change my facial expression in any way during the awkward silence that followed. We simply looked at each other in silence. And again, I go back to that, you know, the, you know, the 15 year old beauty queen. This is, this is that scenario. Sad, scary stuff. But the you know, thing is, and this is the scary stuff, look at in such a short period of time how much our country has been transformed and not 
and not for the better. And here to talk about uh, the big hearing and where we're going. I've asked Dr. Wilmer Leon to come talk with us. He's host of Sirius XM's Inside the Issues, also a nationally syndicated columnist. Dr. Leon, thanks for taking time for us. Rick, thanks so much for having me this morning. How are you? Uh, I'm 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 not good. You know, I'm looking at this. I'm looking at this 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 display. I'm looking at all of this distraction, and I'm thinking about all of the things that we're not doing as a nation, like educating our children, getting health care for people, improving our infrastructure. Uh, I'm just you know while I'm enjoying the spectacle, uh, I'm I'm concerned about the future of this country. Well, it's interesting that you make that point because I'm finishing an op-ed right now, which should be out tomorrow, called JFK's New Frontier versus Trump's America the Usual. And the point of the piece, as we uh, just on the 20, I think the 29th of May, commemorated the 100th birthday of uh, the late President Kennedy, I, I went through and looked at some of his initiatives and um, uh, raising the minimum wage and uh, uh, Medicare, uh, increasing Social Security benefits. He provided federal aid to cities to improve housing and transportation. And then I'm contrasting that to Trump's budget. And it's, it's, it's despicable, it's deplorable, uh, and so much of this seems to be uh, related to what President Eisenhower warned us about, which was the confluence of interest between the military government and corporatists uh, as we look at the military-industrial complex. Yeah, and now turning into the educational military-industrial complex. And you, know, it's an interesting frame that you've made because you go from ask not what your country can do for you to what you can do for your country to screw you guys more for me. Exactly, exactly. And then you you add you add to that as you just talked about education. Now Trump is talking about privatizing airports, privatizing the FAA. Um, just when you think that there is uh, that there's nothing that 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 that, 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 that there is something that still should be sacred, you find that honestly there in his mind there isn't. No, but here's the thing, Doctor, and this is this yeah. is the weird part of this, is, you know, I don't see anything that Trump has done or wants to do as anything outside of the Republican mainstream thought. This idea of privatizing every function of government has been a core central tenet of the GOP for at least a, a couple of decades now. Uh, oh, there's no, there's no question about that, that uh, privatization um, has been at the key of... Um, privatization has been at the key of Republican efforts uh, for a very long time. Now, we can't let Democrats off the hook. Nope. Um, Bill Clinton charged Al Gore with reinventing government as we know it. Yeah. Uh, trying to... Now... And that meant breaking unions and privatizing and all of that stuff. So just, it, I just wanted to throw that in there. We, we had to throw that in there. And then we also have to remember that President Obama... Uh, also, uh, in some regards, was, was more George Bush than George Bush, particularly when it comes to the national security state. So it, it, we can't paint this picture as though it's, it's binary. Um, but to your point, um, uh, the privatization of this, of this country has been um, the, the focal point of, of Republican policy. And then we also have to throw into that how racism has been used to sell this as well. Oh yeah, absolutely. But you know, but here's the thing. You know, as a labor guy, and I'll, I'll you know, I, I I say that all the time. You know, I'm I'm a union guy, and I I look at labor's history. It's always been how do we pit people against each other? White yes. collar, blue collar, black white men, women. It didn't matter. Any way the wealth class of this country can pit people against each other so that they're in fighting amongst themselves and not looking to them is is good in their view. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. Uh, controlled chaos to to a great degree, and we can take this all the way back to the to the end of slavery, and how uh, poor white farmers were convinced that they should not form any type of alliance or allegiance with uh, newly freed slaves. That even though they were poor white farmers, they were white, right? And that uh, because 
what a lot of people don't don't remember about that time in history is newly freed slaves and poor white farmers were actually starting to coalesce. They were starting to work together uh, and champion their interests as laborers. And uh, uh, the corporate interests in this country quickly understood that that was a coalition that absolutely under no circumstances would be allowed to stand. And so the construct of racism or the construct of race was injected uh, into that dynamic and drove uh, a huge uh, 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 division, caused a huge schism between uh, uh, poor white farmers and, 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 and newly freed slaves. Right. You know, a couple of years ago, we had done a civil rights tour with the program, and we went to Durham, North Carolina, to historic Stagville. And if you ever get a chance, you're ever in Durham, uh, it is a great tour. It's a, it's a, but it was a, a former plantation that they've, uh, they've turned into a, a tourist attraction to where you can go see the slave quarters, and they give a fantastic tour. And the woman, you know, took us to one of the slave quarters, which was very well built and, and uh, you know, I'm not going to say nice, but it was it was much better than what the white farmers across the the fence were sleeping in. And you know, she made that exact point. You know, in in this instance, uh, the slaves had actually better living conditions than the the white farmers did. But at least you know, the white farmers thought, well, we're at least not them. Exactly, exactly. And and it and it's and it's important to me, and I I drive this point home and at to some ad nauseum. But it's it's important to understand that race is an artificial construct. It, it does not exist. But it was created in this country in order to accomplish many of the very things that, 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 that you're articulating. Right. But don't you think, Doctor, that you know, it does, even if we were all uh, you know, a cocoa brown color, we would figure, they would figure out a way to pit us against each other, maybe on, on eye color or hairstyle or shoe size or, or something? Yeah. Uh, well, yes, uh, but um, the, the, the phenotypical distinctions are, are so powerful and, and prevalent that I don't know that other tactics would be as successful, and I don't know that other tactics would have endured to the degree that the uh, artificial racial construct has. Because it's very simple to pit. I mean, that's a, that's a very simple binary um, white-black issue right no I, I get it you know look because look i grew up in a housing project on the west side of cleveland one of the f- very few white kids in an all-black neighborhood uh we used to play this neat game called chase the white kid and beat him up i'm sure it was a fun game but you know early on i learned that the only color that really mattered was green because we were all poor at the end of the month we all didn't have food at the end of the month we were all struggling mm-hmm. and, and and we all didn't have money so to me it was it was very clear that uh, it was an economic thing more than it was a uh, a, a black white thing it was a it was an economic thing in in and, and we have to understand yes that 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 poverty and economics uh, is a very very powerful element in the division within this country. But just as you just said, one of the fun games that was played in the neighborhood was chase and beat up the white kid. So even within that uh, that impoverished setting. The race dynamic still found itself to be a real problem, uh, unfortunately for you. Yeah, no, but but do you th- do you think? And, and look, I, I don't really know, but do you think that we we naturally seek out differences uh, just to divide ourselves on a certain level? Well, I do believe in the adage that birds of a feather flock together. Okay, uh, but I think we have to then draw distinctions between. Once the birds of a feather have coalesced, what is the result of that of that gathering? And do they then turn towards those that are unlike them, or do they turn against those that are unlike them? And I think that's an important question because we're living at a time right now where the political power is in the hands of people who who want to pit us against one another. And right now it's it's immigrants and it's uh, you know it's people of color. Uh, what will it be tomorrow? I don't know. But you know this is really central to what's going on today. I think. 
it is it is really central to what is going on today. And there's a fantastic book uh, by um, by an economist guy standing. It's called The Precariat, the New Dangerous Class, and where he's talking about looking at this economically and, and looking at. There's this new group of, of economically impoverished people that are working three and four jobs just to remain poor, and that their, ten, their situation is so tenuous and so precarious that they are now what is being called the precariat class. And this is a very, very, very dangerous development uh, within the, uh, the economy in this country and, and, and the world economy overall. Right. And that's only going to get worse as we continue to automate and continue to pursue trade deals uh, that put us in competition with desperate nations. Well, yes, but that then takes me to uh, Dr. King's comments and observations about the threat of militarism and capitalism. And it's, it's understanding that we're losing jobs due to automation, uh, but when we are taking our limited tax dollars and wasting them on rebuilding a military to fight a, uh, a battle that really doesn't exist, at the expense of our schools, at the expense of our bridges, at the expense of our teachers' salaries and our highways, um, we're creating the mess um, through, because because budgets are numeric representations of priority. Right. It's a moral document. It, it, there you go. Uh, spelled out in numbers and commas and zeros. And, and so we can look at this budget proposed by Donald Trump and we can see exactly whose interests are being represented, whose interests are being protected, and, and who are the people or the class or groups of people that they don't give a damn about. Right, but here's the thing, Doctor. I mean, and and look, I talked about this all during the campaign uh, leading up to this. We knew these were his priorities. We knew that this is what the wealth class does. We know this is what the Republican Party is. I mean, if you read the Republican Party's platform, uh, he's just, he, uh, and look, I'll defend him. He, he was honest. He said he was going to do what he did, and he's doing it. Now, um, you know, they're going to repeal and replace Obamacare. Did he say 24 million or 23 million people are going to be without care? No, didn't care about those people. But a couple of things to that point. First of all, you're right. Uh, but, but, but I think you also have to factor into that, that at the beginning of the um, election, at the, be at the beginning of the process, mainstream media treated Donald Trump as a joke. Yes. They didn't take him seriously. He could call into just about any national news program he wanted to. He could talk for as long as he wanted to. He could say what he wanted to because they basically saw him as comic relief. Oh, no, they saw him as dollar signs. Well, uh, that too. Oh, that too. Uh, no question that, that uh, uh, it, was, it was a Roger Ailes. It was the president of Tar was it NBC that said that he's great for ratings. Yep. So, so we, we, we take that. Then I know you had Greg, uh, Greg Palast on yesterday. I think you had Greg on yep, yesterday. Good man. Yeah. So, so you you then factor in a couple of things. One, Donald Trump did not win the popular vote. He lost by three million votes. So, so this populism that is being discussed, we could we could we could we could argue whether or not, or does he have a mandate? Yes, he won the electoral college, but he did lose the popular vote by three million votes. And then you take Greg's research and see that. If it hadn't been for the cross-check program, Chris Kobach and the Republicans, uh, that the election was basically stolen. No, I've been so, saying this. You know, I've been saying this. You know, for for weeks now, or actually for months, uh, that you know all of this Russian stuff is important. Uh, I wanting, I want to know what what meddling. I want to know how deep it goes. But the ultimate theft was what was brought on by the Republican Party, who for for years have been pursuing policies and and obstacles to the to the voting bo box. I look here in Pennsylvania. Uh, they passed a voter ID law where the the state admitted that what they passed would never would have never stopped anyone from. Uh, <laughs> would have never stopped a crime. They had never found a crime. They had never found anyone who had done it. Uh, they admitted it. But it was the right thing to do because uh, I don't. no one knows why. 
before we pay attention to the Kremlin and before we pay attention to the Russians, we have to focus on Kobach and the Republicans. Yep. That was the damage to our electoral process. Don't worry about Vladimir Putin. He's doing basically what the United States has done in elections around the world for who knows how long. It What put Donald Trump in the White House was Chris Kobach, the cross-check program, and the Republican Party. And now Donald Trump is putting Kobach in charge of the voting commission so that he can then validate the machinations that they're going through to dis- to disenfranchise poor people of color and elderly people in this country. And let's not forget students as well, uh, because look, you know, those are the people. Students as well. uh, those are the people who are going to be, you know, looking for more progressive policies to help them out. But here at the end of this, um, it it comes back to we, us. It's our fault. And this yes. has been a fundamental shift in this country, I believe, because the right wing has built what I think is a masterful echo chamber uh, that has has created a society of of people who believe that they're victims and that it's the poor people who are victimizing them. I I can't debate that with you in the least. Uh, a, a, a clear recent example of that would be. Um, uh, ben Carson's comments that poverty is a state of mind. Some people dismiss that as the uh, rantings of a lunatic. Uh, what you really have to understand, not you because I know you do, what people really have to understand is that is part of a narrative of blaming of the, the, that conservatives love to employ, which is blaming the poor for their plight. Yep. You're poor because you don't work hard enough. You're poor because you didn't spend enough time in school. You're poor because you just think you are. You have this state of mind. If you just changed your mind, you could change your financial circumstance, ignoring the fact of deindustrialization in this country. Ignoring the fact of disinvestment in our public school system. Ignoring the other uh, uh, hard realities of government disinvestment in the core support elements that are important so that all boats can rise with the rising tide. Uh, it, it's incredible stuff. You know, and again, you, you go back to all of the things that destroyed that healthy middle class that our, my grandparents' generation built. Uh, it comes down to all of that, our bad trade policies, uh, the union busting that's been allowed to go on, and all the disinvestment. And I, I bring most of it back to Reagan, but it started a little bit before that. Uh, the idea that, you know, the ketchup inv- is a vegetable guy. Uh, you know, yes. the, f- the fact that we're going to take literally and people were OK with literally taking food out of the mouths of children to give tax breaks to the very wealthy is not a new thing. It's just something that we're not no longer ashamed of, I think. It's, it's something that we're no longer ashamed of. And I would add to that, it's also something the degree to which we have not seen it at at to such a degree, at such a rapid pace. And just so blatantly and patently obvious, and nobody really seems to care that the 400 wealthiest families in this country control, I'm sorry, 400 wealthiest families, I think, in the world control uh, uh, 99% of, of the wealth in this country. There's something there's something seriously wrong with that. And yet we keep hearing, Dr. Leon, that we need more tax cuts, uh, that we need to double down on voodoo Reaganomics, that, we, that the rich people, if we give them all the money, something eventually has to fall out of their pockets that we can scurry for. Well, and see, that, that goes to what we were talking about earlier. Uh, th- that gets to a very fundamental element about uh, or argument which has been the argument since the founding of the country, what is the job of government? 
And that, again, takes us back to this dichotomy between John Kennedy and his New Frontier program and Lyndon Johnson's Great Society and where we are now with Trump's budget. Right. And so if, if, if we all understand that the that the that the the one of the primary elements of government is to take care of those in this country, um, th- as opposed to this um, individualism that we have been that we have that so many of us have been convinced of, right? Um, uh, the individual real self realization, and if you just work harder. You will do well for yourself, uh, uh, not not really uh, caring about the collective and understanding that when everyone is doing better, we all do better. Right. Everyone's doing better when everyone does better. But, you know, here's the thing. What we've been told for so long is we can all be that Horatio Alger uh, character. You know, pull ourselves up by the bootstraps and uh, the self-made man and all of those myths that we've been sold, you know, it's always been my view that uh, what I want government to do are the things that I individually can't do. Uh, You know, build roads, educate the youth, defend the country, end poverty, end homelessness, you know, things that I individually cannot do, but I think we should be doing as a society. That's what government should be doing. That's what government should be doing. Uh, But what the, 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 the prominent narrative now is of course, um, it's all about individualism. It's all about self-actualization. It's gone away from we the people to me and a few other guys. Yeah, and the heck with the rest of you. Now look, I'm, the, I'm all in favor. You know, I want to do as as well as I can do, and I want the next guy to do do as well as he can do, and all of that. But there's there's something wrong when you have a handful of people who can control more wealth than the vast majority of the nation. When you have one family who controls more wealth than almost half of the country, there's a problem with that. There's a problem with that. The framers of the Constitution even understood that there was a problem with that. Thomas Jefferson Thomas Jefferson, and the others understood that if you have a insurmountable, this a vast disparity in wealth, that what you will do is you will sow the seeds of discontent amongst your general populace and that they will revolt against uh, uh, the, 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 the powers that be. And again, you have to add to that, particularly in the current, well, it's, it's, been, a, it's been an ongoing narrative, but it's just been more blatant, with, uh, starting with Ronald Reagan and his welfare queen and all of that kind of stuff, and now what, 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 what Donald Trump is talking about, when you inject xenophobia and you inject bigotry and racism into that narrative, so now you have these bands of crazy Mexicans that are coming over the border to rape and pillage and take our jobs, and and there's a Muslim behind every rock that's looking to blow you up. When you when you when you also then play and fan play into and and, and fan the flames of that narrative. Um, it becomes increasingly easier to sell this foolishness to a broader cross-section of the American population. Yeah, boy, I mean, you go to the bottom of Maslow's hierarchy. What's at the bottom? <laughs> uh, that's where they play. They, they Exactly. You know, they hang out in the bottom. No question. That, because that's the least common denominator. Yep. No, and, and, it's, and that's the simplest thing. That's the simplest thing to play to as you talk to the Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Yeah. That is the simplest thing to play to. Hate and fear plays well. So last question I've got for you, and it's really been fa- I've been, really enjoyed our conversation. What and do we I, do with I, all well. of this? I mean, it's one thing to say we know all of this. How do you fix it? Because, look, I mean, our country is in, in turmoil right now. We've got we've got some really serious problems uh, in, you know, outside of you know, what's going on on the screen right now. Uh, what, 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 are we, what are we suggesting? Well, first of all, uh, people have to read. People that are listening to the people that are listening to you are obviously some fairly intelligent people, and they've got to read. That's the first thing, so that so that they can start to identify the inconsistencies and the hypocrisy in terms of what they're being told, and they can't give up 
on the process. It, to One of the points that you made earlier is that we as a people, we have relinquished our obligation as citizens, and we're now just leaving it up to our elected representatives. Some of this sounds trite, and some of this sounds, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, simplistic. But I honestly believe that, that we can retake control of this country. We first have to take control of our own living rooms. And then once we've taken control of our own living rooms, we can go out <clears throat> and take control of our front yards. And from that point, we can take control of our neighborhood. There you go. Uh, as I always say, if you want to change the world, start with your little piece of it. Hey, there you go. Uh, and it'll spread there you like go. Topsy. There you go. That's it. Dr. William uh, Wilmer Leon, I appreciate you taking time for us. Great talk with you. I'd love to have you back again sometime real soon. Anytime. And let me just tell folks quickly, the book is uh, Politics, Another Perspective, and they can go to WilmerLeon.com to get a copy of the book. And we'll make sure we get a link at therigsmithshow.com so folks can do that. Thanks so much. Appreciate it. Bye-bye. Great talking with you. Let's take a quick break. Right back. Stick around. You're listening to The Rick Smith Show. We're working people. Come to talk. I'm Rick Smith, and this is Labor History in Two. On this day in labor history, the year was 1904. That was the day that John Carley, a union miner, was shot down in Duttonville, Colorado. Carley was part of a strike in the Cripple Creek gold mining region. The miners had gone out on strike in support of workers at the Standard Mill in Colorado City, which processed the mined ore. Colorado Governor Peabody was determined to break the strike. He called in the state militia, who joined forces with Company Army gun thugs, with 1,000 rifles and 60,000 rounds of ammunition to back them up. General Sherman Bell, a veteran of Teddy Roosevelt's Rough Rider squad in the Spanish-American War, led the National Guard. During the strike, one of General Bell's deputies is said to have declared, To hell with the Constitution! We aren't going by the Constitution! This pretty much summed up General Bell's approach to the conflict. The militia began to round up Union miners. More than 1,500 miners were captured and given a so-called trial by the militia. 238 of these miners were then deported from the region. They were shipped by train to Denver, Kansas, and New Mexico and warned not to return. The militia learned of a group of pro-Union workers at a small encampment known as Dunville. General Bell loaded up more than 100 militiamen and company deputies on a train and headed for the camp. There they exchanged gunfire with the miners. 65 miners, armed with just 10 guns among them, had little chance against the well-armed company men. John Carley was killed and 14 miners were arrested. The Union was crushed in the sights of a thousand guns. For more information, go to laborhistoryin2.com, like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter at Labor History in 2. Voter ID, which is going to allow Governor Romney to win the state of Pennsylvania. Done. Taking care of business every day. 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 Taking care of business Taking care of business and working overtime. You got to give him credit. Mike Terzai, the Speaker of the House here in Pennsylvania, uh, wants to be governor. Yeah, uh, and look, I'm sure the voter ID thing would have would have helped him, uh, as it has helped Republicans all across the country. And look, one of the things we've talked about here on the program is how do we get more people to vote? How how is it that in this day and age, uh, the day of o- almost instant anything, uh, you know, voting has become difficult. There's got to be simpler ways. There's got to be better ways to encourage more people. Uh, I'm here to talk a little bit about some ideas. I've asked Liz Kennedy to talk with us. She's the Director of Democracy and Government Reform there at the Center for American Progress. Liz, thanks for taking time for us. Rick, thank you so much. It's my pleasure. Uh, You know, I I look at this idea of, you know, how is it that in this day and age, you know, we're still, you know, doing things like we did, you know, 50 years ago. Uh, There's got to be new, better, safer, smarter. There's got to be something, right? 
And in fact, there is. Uh, I think that is an excellent point. It is 2017, and when we are able to do uh, to use technology to make so many other transactions in our lives more convenient, we should be using our modern technical systems to remove barriers to participation for voting. And the real gold standard there is automatic voter registration. Uh, Oregon was the first state in the nation to adopt it in 2015. It was in place for their elections last year. And we were thrilled to really see in a new report we put out yesterday the impact on how this AVR program expanded the electorate. Uh, Voters were younger, uh, less urban, more low income, uh, and uh, from more racially diverse areas. So really just a terrific modernization that uh, lots of states have already been picking up and beginning to implement, and we look forward to more and more states beginning to automate their voter registration system. Uh, I'll give you a second to, to explain what that is, but you know, I've always said that you know, when I was 18, I turned 18, I had to go to the post office, sign up for selective service, and I'm sure 18-year-olds still have to do that today. Uh, it was uh, it's curious to me why we didn't just say, well, while you're set, signing up to, to join the military and possibly die, um, here, here's, here's your voter registration form. Do them both at the same time. That is actually exactly how I've uh, often put it in the last several years when I was thinking, um, why can the government find my brother when he turns 18, when he needs to sign up for a selective service, and yet we don't have just a similar kind of system for making sure that all eligible citizens are on the voter registration rolls. Voting is really a two-step process in uh, a lot of the country where every state except North Dakota requires voters to be registered before they then cast their votes. Lots of states, uh, about 15 when I last checked, allow you to register and vote uh, on the same day that you vote, through same-day registration or election day registration. So that is also a terrific convenience. A lot of Americans move, you know, et cetera, or they just haven't uh, re-upped their registration. So that's a great um a great process. But with automatic voter registration, what happens is when the government agency in Oregon, just the uh, driver's license bureau, but you know, in other states, other public service agencies will also be source agencies for the information. If the state has the information to confirm that you are an eligible uh, citizen who's able to vote, there's no reason they shouldn't transfer that information from that other government database over to the election database. And then they still preserve the opportunity for folks who really just on principle want to object to becoming registered to vote. And of course, nobody is has to be a voter once they are actually on the list. But this is a safe and secure method to really take away the inconvenience of having to separately do another form or continue to update that info. If you tell the DMV that you've moved, they'll just, uh, you know, share that information with the elections folks so that your records will be updated. It's convenient and it's a modernization whose day has come. Yeah, well, what do you say to the person who doesn't have a driver's license or or, or some other? I mean, because a lot of this is seems to be, you know, I, I have a friend who was integral in, in getting the motor voter thing passed back years ago. Uh, and you yeah. go, what about the people who don't have driver's license? That is a great question, Rick, and that's why it's so important that um, automatic voter registration in order to be inclusive and equitable, which is so key because everyone has an equal right to cast that ballot, um, and we don't want the same kind of inequities and gaps uh, in terms of who currently has access to the system to be replicated in this new automatic voter registration system. But that's why it should expand to the same kind of social service agencies that are included in the original motor voter law, you know, 20 odd years ago in the National Voter Registration Act. So you're exactly right there. Thank you. Yeah. But, you know, what's interesting is you're going to you're going to really upset a lot of the original intent people because only white land owning males of 21 years (laughs) old or older should be allowed to vote, Liz. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'm pretty upset about that. So, you know, I think we, we should look to our uh, the tradition of our American history of expanding the understanding of, of who, uh, you know, who we are as Americans to then include uh, women, to include uh, people of color. We all have an equal right to have our voice heard by the government. And with steps like Um, automatic voter registration. I mean, I just want to share one amazing fact from our report. 
right now, uh, young people, folks that are, are, are under 30, make up 20% of eligible citizens in Oregon, right? They make up about 18% of the uh, folks who were registered to vote through traditional mechanisms. But of course, young people really are much less likely to vote. Low-income people, much less likely to vote. There's a 30-point gap between the low-income people that are registered to vote and the highest-income people that are registered to vote. It's like 50% versus 80%. Right. In With automatic voter registration, about 40% of the AVR registrants and 37% of AVR voters were age 30 or younger. So it just really helps to remove barriers to participation that have been uh, burdening the rights of some people in the country. Um, and, you know, lots of states have been considering bills. Uh, and we we look forward to more and more states adopting this. It's just a really common sense answer uh, to this question of low participation and of just this question of how do we continue to modernize our voter registration systems to make sure that they are secure and serving Americans. A couple of things. You know, what do you think of you know, the, the curmudgeon out there who, go, who goes, look, if you can't figure out how to register and do it on, on certain deadlines, you shouldn't be allowed to vote anyway. Yeah, I think that that is trying to create a hierarchy of voters, like who is a better person. Who's worthy. Yeah, exactly. Who is worthy of casting a ballot? That's not that's not the way that, that, that this is supposed to work. We all are equal. We have equal political rights as American citizens, and it has an impact. If only... You know, first of all, people who are working two jobs, you know, it's it's people who have a time tax when they're, you know, you have to bounce around between, you know, who don't have the flexibility with their working day. It's much more difficult for some folks uh, to register that way than others. Some people, uh, there's a digital divide, right? A lot of um, communities are impacted with less access to the Internet, which impacts everything from education and then now um, potentially voter registration. So the real question question here is just when we can make it more convenient and I should say more efficient for election administrators, just it's an improvement for the whole system. It's a cost saving mechanism. Um, then the real answer is why shouldn't you be doing that? Right. So this is just a question of changing the voter res registration paradigm so that instead of opt in when every individual who moves so frequently has to just keep updating their registration here, the since the state has that information already, they will just a a as a convenience uh, move that forward. And then again, everybody has to, you know, decide themselves to go vote, et cetera. But this just removes that that unnecessary friction of that barrier to participation. Let me ask you the other side of this. As someone who has Luddite tendencies uh, <laughs> and, and not thrilled with the idea of everything being online or everything being electronic, and I point to, you know, a ton of irregularities with voting machines and, and all of that stuff, you know, is, is there a fear that this gets so far away from, you know, the, the paper and pen or the, you know, the, mar the marker and the pen that, that it becomes easily manipulated at some point? Or is there a fear in that? Um, I think that the fact that uh, malign foreign governments, and here I mean Russia, have been seeking to uh, spearfish into certain states' voter registration database is a uh, serious crisis that needs urgent cybersecurity responses. Uh, Russia obviously attempted to interfere in our 2016 uh, election and did interfere. Um, and there's no reason to believe that they won't uh, do the same thing in 2018. And in fact, there are gubernatorial and other races in 2017. This is a very urgent issue to protect the integrity of our uh, election systems. Now, that is a separate question, I think, than, um, than whether to move to automatic voter registration, because there are a lot of, you know, states already have their uh, voter registration databases um, housed electronically. They're not, they're not housing them in pen and paper. And 
Um, there was, you know, I think it was something last I looked like 33 or 35 states that had online voter registration as well. So I think that it's a crucial concern, um, but those are two slightly two separate, separate questions. Right. And I would say, though, that to your larger point as well, we should absolutely make sure that all of the actual voting machines which is not the same thing as these voter registration databases, but every voting voting machine, uh, we need to modernize and invest in them as well. And they all ought to be, uh, you know, where we can have a paper verified trail where there's a paper ballot that gets scanned in some way. Now, I also will say I love a community voter registration drive. Um, you know, I did a lot of that uh, back as a student organizer long ago. So it's terrific when you can have one-on-one -on -one conversations uh, with people over that. But now with a, with a modernization like automatic voter registration, the groups that had to spend so much time just chasing down people individually to say, you know, would you like to register to vote? Would you like to register to vote, et cetera, et cetera, can now spend that time and, and resources actually educating people about the community issues and the political process and the, you know, and the civic engagement questions. So it's actually really uh, helpful in freeing up resources for that as well. Interesting. Last line of questioning I've got for you. Now, you've got Donald Trump running around saying that three million illegals voted. There were three, three million people who voted or actually six or 10 or what. I, I forget the numbers. Uh, but it's based on this idea that there are more registered voters uh, than uh, than than voter than voters that you could be registered in a couple of different places and I know, you know Chris Kobach the, the Kansas uh, Attorney General there or Secretary of State um, you know is pushing this cross check system how would that interact if you're having an automatic voter registration drive where maybe you're being picked up by two or three different areas um, you know any any thoughts um, yeah that's I mean. Look, the the Kobach Commission and uh, Trump's statements undermining the faith in and integrity of uh, American democracy um, are shameful. And the Kobach Commission is a witch hunt against American voters. So that is absolutely um something that people that we're keeping an eye on that other people should uh, keep an eye on because we all know that the uh, just rank voter suppression that uh, those folks have been engaged in now for uh, for several years um, has been keeping you know hundreds of thousands of Americans from having their voices heard at the polls so they can elect a government that represents them and is responsive and accountable to the people of this country so that is uh, a real danger. Um, but the point that you raise about, you know, how do you check in on uh, people being registered in more than one state, there's two things I'll say. First of all, it is, of course, not actually illegal to be uh, registered to vote in more than one state. And many people, you know, may have lived in one state and then moved to another state and then they've registered in that new state and they had just didn't cancel their old registration. There is a terrific system um, known as ERIC, the Electronic uh, Registration Information Center, I think. Um, and they do a very good job. States run it. And there, these states um, exchange their voter registration lists so that they can uh, make sure that there is accurate uh, kind of data exchange. And one thing that's great here is that if they identify people who are eligible citizens who have moved into that new state that were on, uh, you know, on the old state's rolls, the new state will actually send, you know, a voter registration form saying, welcome, and, you know, please register to vote here in this new state. So that's a pro-voter system for uh, for exchanging state voter registration databases, not like CrossCheck, which doesn't have the same kind of protective mechanisms for eligible citizens and registered voters. Um, and also the NVRA, you know, has legal requirements to keep people, keep states rather, from taking eligible citizens off their voter rolls simply for not voting. Because, again, you have the right to be registered to vote, and then you have the right not to vote. So there's no reason. And so the law says states cannot remove people who are on their voter rolls simply because they haven't actually cast a ballot. Um, and that is 
uh, a really important question. Uh, as you know, we've seen huge problems with illegal and improper voter purges. For example, in Ohio, they were kicking people off the rolls in the last several years simply for not voting. The Sixth Circuit uh, found that they were violating the NVRA, um, that they had kicked you know, an untold number of people off the rolls, and they required them to put 7,500 people back on the rolls so they could cast a ballot in 2016. Those are just the, the you know, some folks they could identify who'd been un- improperly removed. Yeah, those so are the, the ones we problem. know about. Yes, exactly. So the real problem is the way in which voter purging and improperly removing eligible Americans who have gone through the trouble of getting themselves registered, um, that is a voter suppression technique that is keeping Americans from actually casting a ballot and having their voices heard. That's the problem, not this you know, fake news of uh, this myth of illegal voting, um, which unfortunately uh, some American officials continue, no matter how much it has been utterly disproved, um, they continue to push that myth to serve their political goals, which is to keep Americans uh, from voting, which is really shameful. But we will keep fighting that and turning back to solutions. Uh, It sounds like a good idea to me. I've always thought it was dumb that you even had to register. I just always thought as a matter of citizenship, it should have been there. This sounds like a a step forward. And we could end the gimmicks like, uh, if you remember J. Kenneth Blackwell, the Secretary of State of Ohio, tried to get all kinds of voter registrations thrown out because they weren't on 80-way paper. I remember that, and that is one of the – exactly. That's just like the old Jim Crow of saying, you know, first you have to tell me how many jelly beans there are in this, 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 you know, jar or what have you. You know, these are just ostensibly neutral uh, ways, but really to just keep people away from – the ballot box. And uh, as, as I think we've been talking about, as you said, it's a basic right of citizenship. It is fundamental to the protection of all of our other rights. It is fundamental to our entire system of the idea of democracy is based on consent of the governed. So when any elected official are taking steps to make it more difficult for eligible citizens to participate politically, you know, that's why we saw 93 million eligible citizens in America did not vote in the last election. So what we really have is a crisis of low civic participation, but we can understand that we are the authors of our nation's laws when we do participate, hold our representatives accountable. The most important way to do that, there are lots of ways to be involved in politics, but the most important way to do that is by voting and now fighting for these terrific new policies like automatic voter registration so that when the state just knows your information already, whether just from the DMV or Alaska does it through their permanent dividend fund, which is cool, just an Alaska thing. And Illinois, if the governor signs the bill that was passed unanimously on bipartisan out of both houses, that'll be a state that opens, expands uh, AVR to include other public service agencies. So I think we're going to get there, but we really have to keep fighting for solutions so that we can um, rebalance power in democracy, but in AVR, really just common sense solutions to remove barriers so more people can participate. Well, it sounds like all good stuff. I appreciate the time. Great talk with you, Liz. Good stuff. Thanks so much. It's my pleasure. And if folks have more questions, there's an explainer video and an interactive map and then a whole report full of all the data on the American Progress website. There you go. Good stuff. And if you want to take a look at the article, we'll get a link at the ricksmithshow.com. Who votes with automatic voter registration? The question. Uh, we'll have the article. Quick break. Right back. Stick around. You're listening to The Rick Smith Show. We're working people. Come to talk. Listening to the Rick Smith Show. I'm Rick.
Rick Smith, and this is Labor History in Two. On this day in labor history, the year was 1917. That was the day the Granite Mountain and Speculator Mines in Butte, Montana caught fire, killing 168 miners. It is considered the worst underground hard rock mining disaster in the nation's history. Just weeks after the U.S. had entered World War I, the demand for copper had surged. Granite Mountain, like many of the nation's mines, operated around the clock to meet war production needs. In his book, Fire and Brimstone, the North Butte Mining Disaster of 1917, Michael Puntke notes the irony of the disaster, which began as an effort to improve safety. A sprinkler system had just been installed. The final task was the relocation of an electrical cable. The cable was insulated with oil-soaked cloth sheathed in lead. Workers lost control of the three-ton cable as they lowered it into the mine and it fell to the bottom of the shaft. Carrying a commonly used carbide burning lamp, the night shift foreman accidentally ignited the cable as he planned its removal. The conflagration was virtually immediate and burned for more than three days. At the time, 415 miners were at work on the over night shift. Smoke and gases quickly filled both mines. With no alarm system in place, those that could not escape succumbed to carbon monoxide poisoning. In 1996, a memorial plaza was dedicated to those who lost their lives. It details a slice of Butte's mining and labor history that culminated in tragedy. The suffering and the pain We remember to this day the miners, the miners. Labor History in Two brought to you by the Illinois Labor History Society and the Rick Smith Show. Making the blue blood see red. The Rick Smith Show. Website, rick.smithshow.com. Questions, comments, something on your mind. You can email me, Rick, at the rick.smithshow.com. The uh, look, you know, the reality is uh, the spectacle on display today. James Comey, uh, the testimony. Uh, look, you, you know, the big, the big takeaways so far are uh, the president lies. Uh, that was uh, uh, that was Comey's Comey's fear. You know, the, the guy's gonna lie about me. Uh, the guy was, uh, look, uh, yeah, it was the situation, it was the circumstance, uh, it was, well, it was the guy. Uh, and, you know, the, the steel dossier, another one of those those things. Uh, again, you know, in my view, uh, you know, they're, they're like any bit of op- opposition research, you want all of the, the ugly craziness. And, you know, this was... Uh, this was something that Comey did not say anything about. And, you know, I think that was, again, one of the things uh, from the beginning. You know, what was in it that you agreed with? Uh, and, and I know everyone gets hook, caught up on the hookers and the, the golden showers and all that. Uh, I don't know that that's true. But just because that might not be doesn't mean the rest of it's garbage. Uh, it'd be interesting to see that. Uh, nothing really new on uh, little Loretta Lynch and Clinton. And again, it goes back to one of my earlier thoughts and questions of, you know, did Trump try and influence the FBI director to to, to look in that direction? Uh, and, you know, I would love to be in the, the classified meeting. Uh, because that's where you're going to get a lot of the really frank stuff. Everything that we're seeing here is, you know, kind of grandstanding, kind of, uh, you know, especially the politicians trying to, you know, find their angle uh, to be able to use this as, uh, you know, a little political, little fodder. Going to be, going to be interesting. Uh, and and like like James Comey, uh, Lordy, I hope there are some tapes. <laughs> I hope I hope there are, because uh, it would it would sure make would sure make this all uh, fairly, fairly interesting. Uh, if you've got any thoughts, I'd love to hear it. Rick at the Rick Smith uh, In this, in this, he said, he said, which he do we believe? Uh, do we believe the guy who has had a stellar career 
Uh, you can you can say what you want about the last couple of decisions. And look, I'm not thrilled with the fact that uh, that Comey did what he did. Uh, but I don't believe the Donald either. Love to hear your thoughts. Rick at the Show.com. Thanks so much for tuning in. Uh, you can get the podcast at the Show.com. Love to see you back here tomorrow. Thanks so much for tuning in. It's coming from the window. You've been listening to The Rick Smith Show. Together, we can make America better. Email rick at the ricksmithshow.com or interact with us anytime at the ricksmithshow.com. Until next time, this has been The Rick Smith Show, where working people come to talk. It's coming like the tide of flood beneath the Buddha sway. Imperial, mysterious, and amorous raid. Democracy is coming.